teaching sport, ways of challenging coach, coach anxiety through a children's rights approach. A little, little bit of a background on who I am. First of all, I'll be delivering this WebEx today. My name is Dr. Melanie Lang, and I'm a senior lecturer in child protection in sport at Edge Hill University in Ormskirk. My contact details are on the slide there. More than happy for you to get in touch with me if you have any questions about anything we're going to go through today. I'm a former elite athlete myself on the British um, junior swim teams, and I'm also a youth swimming coach and was until very recently a club welfare officer. I'm also a member of the Child Protection and Sport Unit Research Evidence and Advisory Group, and my research interests as an academic are based around children's rights in sport, safeguarding and child protection policy and practice, and also evaluating safeguarding and child protection in sport policy and its implementation. So a brief overview first of what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the context of adult child touch in sport uh, before moving on to some of the common myths and how we might challenge those within a sports context. We'll also be looking at the different forms of adult child touch or physical contact, specifically varieties called instructional caring and abusive touch. We'll also then go on to talk about how the current perspective used to discuss adult child touch has tended to be a very adult-centred approach. And I will suggest a new approach, adopting a more child-centred lens. And finally, finish off with a few recommendations for how we might um, encourage coaches and other adults working within sport to consider guidelines around uh, touching practice in a more positive way. So the overall purpose, really, of the WebEx is to look sort of beyond some of what you might have seen, some of the scare stories and the hearsay about adult child touch in sport, and instead to look at what the evidence tells us, the facts around adult child touch, in order to enhance our evidence-based practice and help all adults that are involved in sport understand why guidelines on what's appropriate um, and how to coach um, effectively and appropriately using touch are necessary. So the starting point for this talk is that children, as, as you well know, children have been abused in and beyond sport. Um, it's because of this, really, that we need guidelines on appropriate forms of touch. Um, it's, these guidelines are useful to communicate to coaches the duty of care that they have to protect children. And as we'll see later on, Touch can and has been used in the past, both in sport and beyond sport, to desensitise children to sexual abuse as part of the process of grooming. That's another reason that these guidelines that, that the Child Protection Sport Unit and some governing bodies of sport have on appropriate forms of touch are necessary. So there's been a dramatic rate of progress in, in terms of safeguarding and child protection sport in the last 10 to 15 years. And we really should be proud um, as a country uh, in the fact that we're really a leader in this area in the world. Um, of course, there's been a lot of very high profile cases recently in the media of predominantly focusing on sexual abuse um, and sexual harassment. Um, in towns such as Rotherham and Rochdale, and also by celebrity figures such as Jimmy Savile, Max Clifford, um, Rolf Harris. And these have all served to raise the profile of safeguarding and child protection, both in the UK and broader, um, abroad. So this has had the consequence of increasing awareness of child protection and safeguarding in sport. And it's also increased interest in adults' role in sport and adult-child relations in particular. And one of the unintended consequences of this higher profile has been concern expressed by some adults about allegations of abuse and the fact that they may be accused of abuse. 
if they're in a contract working with, with children. So you may, for example, have seen headlines such as this in the popular press, um, popular media. Um, for example, stories about teachers working in loco parentis, apparently saying that they're reluctant and sometimes um, in some of the media saying that they're afraid to engage in physical contact with pupils and other young people. You may even have seen similar media stories about adults in sport saying similar things, saying they're concerned about touching young athletes, about being left alone with them. You may even have heard coaches or other adults in sport saying this to you yourself, perhaps when um, you've been delivering safeguarding uh, workshops. And the concern here that's apparently being expressed is that some adults, both in sport and beyond sport, are concerned about being accused of abuse and, as the story on the screen there shows, perhaps being um, labelled or treated as a potential paedophile. Now, there is some, albeit limited, evidence of this concern in research in sport, um, particularly research that's worked with coaches and also PE teachers, both in the UK um, and elsewhere, such as Sweden and Australia. So some of this research has found that coaches seem to be expressing concern about being accused of abuse and suggesting that they are changing the way that they work with children and young people as a result, in the hope, really, that their, their behaviour is less likely to be um, misinterpreted. And you can see on these couple of these quotes for you to read. Um, these are some quotes from published research um, from a variety of countries working with coaches and PE teachers. So the motivation behind what these coaches are saying appears to be uh, self-protection. Now, it's really important to recognise this because understanding why some coaches may be feeling this way can help us to identify ways of overcoming their concerns. And I will come back to this a little later. I'll just give you a moment to read those quotes. Now, if we want to help coaches to better understand how to use physical contact and touch appropriately and to enhance good practice in relation to safeguarding and child protection in sport, we need to understand some of the common myths that surround adult child touch. You may again have heard some of these comments yourself, and I'd be really interested to hear perhaps in the comments box on how you respond when people um, say these sorts of things to you. So here I'm just going to show you some of the ways, um, some of the common myths that I've encountered um, and how I would respond to them, um, using uh, as far as possible research evidence to challenge some of the common myths around physical contact touch in sport. So one of the first common refrains that I've heard is that, well, all touch all forms of touch must be bad, that's why there's guidelines. Um, so my response to that really is that this is a very simplistic way of looking at touch. As we'll see in a moment, there are different kinds of touch, some positive and some uh, negative. So obviously not all forms of touch are bad, but as I'll go on to in a moment, negative forms of touch, such as um, abusive touch, is obviously bad. But other forms of touch can be very positive. Another very common myth that I've heard repeated is that touch is banned, in some way not permitted in a sports context. And actually, um, 
this isn't correct. That there are certain principles that should be followed to safeguard children when physical contact is used, but physical contact and touch are not prohibited. Um, the Child Protection and Sport Unit has their own guidelines on physical contact and specific sports may have also. Um, and these guidelines recognise that the specific context of sport and that touch may well be essential in some sports. If we think, for example, of gymnastics, where children's physical safety may be at risk if some form of touch isn't used perhaps to hold a child when they're learning a tumble. So it is important, and I'll come back to this later, it is important that sports have sport-specific guidelines that reflect the different forms of touch that are used um, in that sport. But it's certainly not the case that touch, physical contact, all forms of physical contact are banned or prohibited in, in sport. Another common belief um, is that coaches are at risk of being accused of abuse if they use physical contact with athletes. The evidence on this categorically refutes this, however. Allegations of abuse themselves are relatively rare, particularly given um, the number of young people and coaches involved in sport. Unfounded allegations, also known as false allegations sometimes, are even rarer still. There was one study um, of allegations to one national governing sport in the early 2000s and over a three and a half year period there were 152 allegations for all forms of abuse. These were investigated and only one of those 152 cases across three and a half years was found to be an unfounded or a false allegation and that represents a 0.02% chance of an individual being wrongly, falsely accused of abuse. So it's just not the case that coaches who use physical contact appropriately in sport are likely to be accused of abuse. It's also worthwhile, I think, noting that touch itself is a really useful and, and powerful form of communication. So it's a great communication when touch is used appropriately. It can help develop positive relationships, can reduce stress and anxiety, um, can increase feelings of security and reassurance. Importantly, particularly for a coaching context, is that touch is also a really useful teaching tool. It can be used to help guide uh, guide athletes when they're learning in these skills, for example. Another key point is that experiences of appropriate positive touch can help children learn to recognise inappropriate touch. So it's actually important that children understand what is positive appropriate touch and it can because that can help them recognise um, the opposite negative form. But as we mentioned earlier, touch can also be used to harm young people such as through physical abuse and to groom children for sexual abuse. For example, many abusers use subtle increasing touch behaviours to de desensitise children to sexual abuse. There's a need, therefore, to acknowledge the differences between different forms or different dimensions of touch, both positive and negative, to educate coaches on appropriate forms of touch. Let's look first at how adult child touch is often presented in media stories, in some research, and in adult conversations about concern over touch in children. We see that these discussions are often predicated on the impact of safeguarding and child protection regulations on adults rather than on children. For example, research, media stories, and conversations with adults often speak negatively about child protection regulations, accusing them, for example, of being restrictive, of creating fear and anxiety about using touch, and of preventing adults from doing their job or developing positive relationships with children. 
But where here is the focus on the child in such discussions? Such adult-centred notions ignore the fact that child protection and safeguarding regulations were introduced to protect and safeguard children. There's a need, therefore, to challenge such ideas to avoid reproducing and perhaps further heightening negativity and misunderstandings around safeguarding and child protection regulations and around adult child touch and to put the real reason such regulations were created to protect children back at the heart of these discussions. An alternative approach that offers the potential to challenge common negative portrayals of safeguarding and child protection and touch regulations is to look at the issue, this issue not from the perspective of the impact of these regulations on adults but on children. One starting point here is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child or the UNCRC, an international law that the UK has signed up to and that underpins our child welfare system. The UNCRC states that the best interests of the child must be the primary concern in all decisions relating to children and young people. Considering safeguarding and child protection regulations and touch from this more child-centred perspective leads to questions being raised about why and how coaches use touch in their practice. For example, who is touch for? What's it being used for? Who's making the decisions about this? How might the touch affect the child and is it being used in the child's best interests? In applying a more child-centred approach then, we see that coaching practice should reflect the best interests of the child. Touch should only be used if it benefits the athlete, not the coach, and if it has a positive impact on the child athlete. In other words, a child-centred approach on touch suggests it is appropriate, but only if it's justified and if it's necessary. Equally, thinking about this issue from a child-centred perspective, we can see that children have the right to be included in the decision about whether and how coaches touch them. Now, of course, this may challenge traditional beliefs about coaching practice, particularly adult-centred beliefs and practices. But the best coaches are willing to change their practice and put children at the heart of what they do. And as coach educators, we've got to help them to understand in a positive way their responsibility for putting children first. So what can sports organisations, coach educators and others in the sports community do to promote child-centred thinking and practice. One first step is to educate parents and children on the extent of physical contact that is normal and expected as part of the specific sport being undertaken. Also, teach them about their right to consent and to refuse to such contact. Similarly, sport-specific guidelines on physical contact should be distributed to everyone in the sport coaches, officials, parents and children to raise awareness of what's considered appropriate in that context. Equally, education courses for coaches and for parents and athletes should teach about positive, acceptable touch practices, having drawn first on the opinions of children on this. Coach education also needs to teach coaches positively about alternative pedagogical strategies, ways of coaching effectively that may, in some cases, not require physical contact with athletes. Equally, to ally adults as concerned, we need to educate coaches on the low rate of unfounded allegations of abuse. One study, for example, in sport found there's only a 0.02% chance of this happening. Helping coaches to understand this and teaching them to begin to be critical of adult-centred adult sensationalist media stories is a useful way forward. NGBs can also help 
play a part here by having a clear and well promoted mechanism for everyone, including children, to report concerns about physical contact in a positive and a non threatening way. Finally, everyone who cares about children in sport needs to reinforce positively the principle of child centeredness and its implications for coaching, reminding adults to consider whether touch is necessary and justified, whether it is of benefit to the child, whether it could cause any distress or harm to the child, whether the child understands and their parent understands why touch is being used, whether the child and their parent consent to that touch, and ultimately, whether the touch is being used in the best interests of the child. Thanks for listening today. If you've got any, if you require any further information or guidance on physical contact in sport, please contact Sports Touch UK, your sports organisation safeguarding officer, um, or see the CPSU's guidelines on physical contact with children and young people in sport. Thanks for listening.